Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. And welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 421 for the 24th of Tevez in a regular year. I'd like to start off today's episode by going back several years ago when I ran a half marathon. So this is, you know, back in the day, I, I actually, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I don't know, but I no longer jog. I, I used to be a regular jogger. <clears throat> now I switched uh, over to gymnastics and um, like more yoga type of things uh, for several reasons. But back in the day, I was a very regular jogger. That was my main form, form of exercise was running. I would run pretty much every day for half an hour to an hour every single day. You know, sometimes it, usually I'd run maybe about like seven miles, maybe eight miles, if I recall co- correctly. And, uh, and I had, I had done races before I had done like 5k races, 10k races. I once even was very proud. I, I won the local 5k race in the in prospect park for my age group. It wasn't really a very it's not that I ran so fast, but I guess my competition wasn't so great, <laughs> whatever it is. But I was, I was really proud of winning that race. Um, but regardless, so getting back to the story is there had come up an opportunity to run a half marathon in Miami. And it was to raise money for a charitable organization called Yachad, you know, and it sounded like a really fun adventure. So I said, sure, why not? You know, and I decided to embark upon it. And so just to give a little bit of, of context for those of you that don't know so a half marathon is the the distance of that is 13.1 miles so as mentioned my usual jogging routine was really more like maybe seven maybe eight maybe on you know a really good day it'd be like nine miles if I wanted to run a little extra and I never really ran for speed it was just really more leisure you know more for exercise that type of thing so So that was, that was my jogging routine and I really was not very competitive about it. And I decided to sign up for this half marathon, which again, I had never done anything like this before. And I didn't really, I I was doing it mainly for the adventure or pretty much only for the adventure and also, you know, to raise money for charity uh, along the process. So I was not being competitive about it. I didn't even train for it. I said, you know what? I jog every day. That's, that's good enough. I'm just going to keep up with my routine, not going to do anything different. And I did, you know, and I just made sure to just keep jogging every day. Uh, when I, and then when I got there, when I got to Florida, I didn't do anything special. Maybe I don't even remember warming up or anything like that. It was just like, okay, time to jog. It was a really fun experience. And There were a bunch of people there and I remember there was like this big high of being amongst all these people and we're all there for the same thing and I really didn't put much thought into it. So I get there, you know, to the start of the race and there was a moment where I kind of had this realization like, wait a second, what did I get myself into? This is, will I really be able to do this? And I figured worst case scenario, you know, I could always walk. (laughs) It might take a while, but I, you know, I'm like, whatever, we'll see what happens. So I start jogging and in the beginning I'm having a great time and it's really great. It's like mile one goes back by, I'm like, this is a breeze. And they give you these little markers as you go by, like where you're up to, like first mile, second mile, whatever it is. First mile goes by, second mile goes by, third mile goes by. I'm like, this is so much fun. This is great. I'm jogging, but I'm with all these people. I'm in a new environment. It's really fun. I'm having a great time. Maybe I was thinking, I I think I ate a little bit too late the night before, so I might have felt the food moving around in my stomach, but otherwise I was doing okay. Fourth mile goes by, fifth mile goes by. I'm still going strong. Six mile goes by, seven mile goes by, eight mile goes by. I start to feel myself getting a little bit like, okay, you know, this is getting a little challenging, but I, it didn't feel unfamiliar, you know, and it felt like really like, like, 
okay, this, I'm starting to feel the sweat. I'm starting to feel myself work, but, um, but it's, it's definitely not, not unfamiliar. I've run eight miles many times and, you know, not a big deal. I get to the ninth mile and I was like, okay, wow. Okay. This is, I I've been here and this is, you know, but, but it's starting to feel like work. It's starting to feel really, 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 really tough, you know? And then I remember when I got to the 10th mile, it was completely different. It was like, this is not familiar. This is not anything I have ever experienced before. We are in new territory. And those last three miles, I made it. I did make it to the end, but they were really tough. And it was not fun. <laughs> and it was grueling. And it was difficult. And it was really, and I really wished I had trained at that point. And I was like, this is this is definitely not something I've ever done before. And this is a lot harder than anything I've, I've, any jogging I've ever done. And so now think about that for a moment. So isn't that interesting? You know, I had jogged nine miles with, I don't want to say no difficulty, but I was able to do it, keeping my standard pace and speed. And it, it was, I was all right. I was doing fine. Nine miles. Then there's three miles at the, at the end, three miles that were almost impossible for me to do. I, you know, I found myself struggling. I'm sure I walked some of it. So how does that make sense? Logically, it's like nine miles are fine, but three miles are not okay. So this is the topic of, of the Tanya of today, believe it or not, is this idea that the definition of work isn't something that you can really give an objective quantity for that applies to everybody but rather it's something that's very, very individualistic and it has to do with your own personal comfort zone, whatever that may be. And that's going to vary from person to person. So somebody who runs full marathons on a regular basis, and there are people that do this, may be listening to this story and being like, oh, wow, you know, 10 miles, psh, that's nothing. That's a breeze because <laughs> a full marathon is 26 miles. And maybe for the full marathoner, they don't hit that point of breaking their comfort until they hit mile 20. Who knows? Everybody's very different. For somebody who's never jogged in their whole life, maybe running three steps is already above their comfort zone. This is something that's going to really vary from person to person. So for me, that whole first nine miles, we wouldn't really constitute it as work. If it was somebody, you know, if I was trying to work to achieve a certain goal and go over and above myself, those nine miles are not really work. That's like I'm just maintaining my status quo. The work began for me after those nine miles. So even though it was only three miles after that, those three miles were so much more valuable in a way, quote unquote, as as work, so to speak, than those first nine miles were. So with that, we will begin the text of the Tanya, and um, we're in the, the middle of chapter 15, and we'll see how this relates to our service of God, of our work and toil when it comes to serving God. So if you remember, this is, maybe you've already put this in context a little bit. Yesterday, we were talking about this idea of that a benoni, this, this definition of a benoni, somebody who never sins, who never does anything that's against the will of God, actually falls into two categories. It falls into the category of one who works, the Oved Elohim, and then it falls in, there's some being a name that falls into the category of one who does not work. This is somebody who does not serve God. And we explained that what this means is that how how could you be a being a name that doesn't serve God? That's what we really focused on yesterday. This is somebody who never sins, who never goes against the will of God, never does anything wrong, but they're not working. It's not hard for them. They're not a passionate person by nature. They don't have really strong desires or urges or temptations and things like that. So it's okay. So they don't fall into temptation because they don't really have temptation. So it's not that commendable for them. So today we're going to focus on this latter category, which is the Benoni who does work. What does that look like? What what would it look like to be a Benoni who works, who toils, who serves God with this, uh, with this service, this, this like really active kind of service, which as we'll see, is actually the type of Benoni that we all should be striving to be. So the Altar Rebbe begins by citing the Gemara, where it says that an Oved Elohim, one who serves Hashem, is a person who reviews what he is learning 101 times. And one who is not does not serve God is one who reviews what he's learning 100 times only. And the reason for this, he explains, is because back in the day, it was the it was habit, it was habitual to review what you were learning a hundred times. And the Talmud gives an analogy for this 
uh, regarding donkey drivers that back in the day, they, instead of taxi cabs, there were donkey drivers. You know, one way to get around was to hire somebody to drive you around in a donkey. And these donkey drivers would char- would charge per distance. So what they would charge, so this is an analogy that's given in the Gemara, is they would charge one zuz, which was an element of money, to travel 10 Persian miles versus then they would charge two zuzim for... 11 Persian miles, which seems to be like a weird mathematical calculation that it's like, you know, 10 miles is one zuz and then that one extra mile, you're charging a whole, you're charging double for that. And it's explained because this extra 11th mile was over and above what they were used to. And so going back to this teaching about reviewing what a person's learning is that since in back in those days it was very they were in the habit of of reviewing things a hundred and time a hundred times then this 101 time is equivalent to all of the first 100 ones and in fact it's actually even greater than all of these and it is this 101st review that gives this student the title of being one who serves god because in order to change a person's nature One must arouse within them the love of God that they have through meditating upon the greatness of God within one's mind and to conquer over their nature. That's within the left ventricle of the heart that's filled with blood that we talked about, the blood of the animal soul that comes from Kripa. And this is where this natural, this nature comes from. And it's, it says that it's a complete service for a Benoni. This is the ultimate utmost service of a Benoni to overcome this nature. So as we've been describing that if a person is able to overcome their nature and surpass their natural inclination, whatever it is. So, you know, the, the, the definition that the Gemara gives is that to review something 101 times, which is over and above that habitual amount of a hundred times, this is, this is the Benoni overcoming their nature, which this overcoming of nature, how they conquer that animal soul within them. And then the Alter Rebbe gives a second way that a Benoni can get to this level of also that's called service, that if he wants to be in this category of a Benoni who serves God. And this is by arousing the hidden love that's found within their heart to rule over his nature that's found within the left ventricle of the heart, meaning the, the animal soul, as we talked about. So he says that this too is called service of God. So if a person just, you know, if it's not an intellectual thing, but instead it's just that a person becomes aware of this innate love that we talked about that we all have for God, and they become aware of that, and they find a way to arouse that within themselves, then this too is a type of service of God. However, the altar says, if there's no war, if there's no fighting going on at all, then this... Like if, like if this love stays within the inner recesses of the heart in this innate way and a person is just like, yeah, you know, I naturally love God. I, I'm not super conscious of it, but, you know, <laughs> it's just there. Then um, that's not called service of God. There needs to be some kind of fight, some kind of war. So just to recap, so the altar of his main message here is just like I started off with my half marathon analogy is in order for something to be considered work, to be considered service for a Benoni, there has to be a fight. There has to be a war. There has to be some type of movement going on. So that could manifest in the most ideal state by virtue of the Benoni learning over and above their nature. So, and, and, so if they're if they're they have the habit of, of reviewing something a hundred times to review it for that next 101st time would be an example of that. And another way that a Benoni could also come into this mode of being a fighter of a, of a, a servant of God is by becoming aware of this innate love that they have and for God and arousing it. So it's more of an emotional kind of thing. So the first one is a little bit more intellectual. It's about more intellectually, um, really contemplating and meditating upon God in this way that goes over and above their natural norms. And then the second one is a more emotional kind of thing where it's just arousing this hidden love within themselves and using that to overcome their impulses that might want to make them go against the will of God. So I hope that was clear and we will continue tomorrow when we get into chapter 16. I'll speak to you then. Thanks for listening to the It Is Top podcast hosted by Sarit Switzer. This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Abraham Yitzhak Ben Binyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. 
If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Taught project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.